Ignition sequence starts. Good morning. You've got a good view of the International Space Station Flight Control Room here at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, where there's a team on duty 24-7, keeping tabs on the operation of the space station and its systems, and standing by to assist the Expedition 65 crew members as they near the end of their work week. Commander Aki Hoshide and his American, Russian, and French crewmates have been focused on maintaining all of the systems of their combination home and office on orbit while supporting operations of the science experiments underway in the station's laboratory modules. Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Nila Faramji. With the return of SpaceX's commercial resupply mission 22 back to Earth, the science investigations aboard will continue to make impacts. The Lyophilization 2 experiment is one of the investigations on the Dragon spacecraft. Lyophilization or freeze drying is a common method for formulating pharmaceuticals with improved chemical and physical stability. This investigation could result in improved freeze drying processes for pharmaceutical and other industries. Meanwhile, NASA astronaut Mark Vantahai was busy working on spaceflight nutrition. The food physiology investigation is designed to characterize the key effects of an enhanced spaceflight diet on immune function, the gut microbiome, and nutritional status indicators. These factors are interlinked, but diet is the only one that can be easily altered on Earth or during spaceflight. This investigation aims to document the effects of dietary improvements on human physiology and the ability of those improvements to enhance adaptation to spaceflight. The food physiology investigation studies how an enhanced diet affects astronauts' health. The enhanced diet includes an increased selection of fruits and vegetables and foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Keeping astronauts healthy on long duration missions is essential and this study seeks to define targeted, efficient dietary changes to maintain crew health and performance. It could also contribute to our understanding of how complex organisms adapt to spaceflight. Food continues to be the theme as NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur worked on the first formal investigation of how a repetitive menu affects astronauts during spaceflight. The Food Acceptability Investigation examines changes in the appeal of food aboard the International Space Station during long duration missions. Acceptability of food, whether crew members like and actually eat something, may directly affect crew caloric intake and associated nutritional benefits. That's Space to Ground for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. One priority of the International Space Station's science research program is to learn as much as possible about how living in space affects the human body. Uh, shortly before she came home, flight engineer Anne McLean and her crewmates finished up the data gathering on the airway monitoring experiment, which examines an astronaut's exhaled breath for signs of inflammation, creating data that could help in the design of future spaceships. The International Space Station is a national orbiting laboratory. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. One category of those experiments are human research, experiments on our human body, how we react in microgravity. One of the recent ones that I've been a part of is called airway monitoring, uh, and this is looking at uh, airway inflammation up in space. So when, when we're breathing the air, you know, the, the small particles in the air, they don't just fall to the ground like, like dust on the, on the ground. So we, we tend to inhale more fine particles than we would on Earth. Uh, and so we're looking at the, our response, our body's response to that by measuring uh, nitric oxide uh, exhalations as an indicator for airway inflammation. And so understanding, you know, how clean does our air need to be? How does our body react to the, to the air? When we talk about going back to the moon, uh, you know, a lot of people are aware that the, the moon dust is a very, very fine particle. It's almost like a powdered sugar fine par particle. And if that's in the air and, and, and we're breathing that for, for months on end, if we're, if we're doing, you know, extended stays on the lunar surface, uh, you know, we need to understand kind of how that affects the, the human body.
All of the International Space Station crew members spend some of their time working on science experiments that take advantage of the absence of gravity, such as when astronaut Doug Hurley squeezed a bag of fruit punch. In that case, the fluid that squirted out of the bag wound down a clear tube and it soaked into a block of white foam, providing researchers with better information on how to manage fluids in microgravity. Mark, station on three, how do you hear? This is Doug. Doug, I got you five by five. We started maybe 15 years ago in this long line of experiments that um, have been going to space that are all small scale fluids experiments that have really taught us a lot about uh, managing fluids in space without any moving parts, without any electricity, just fluidics. Now we can apply research results that we've learned from doing experiments in space to actual space systems that actually require gravity to be gone for them to work. That's different. That's a new horizon, I would say. Okay, Mark, ready on step four. This is an engineering demonstration of a wastewater purification system. So inside that foam, there are all these weird channels and, and different wetting foams in there such that capillary forces wick the liquids out, opening the channels up. So it's a capillary solution to an engineering problem of managing brine and contaminated uh, water streams. Yeah, it sounds really, uh, really interesting and uh, frankly, really cool. I can't wait to see what it does. What you're gonna do is you're gonna open that little valve out of the drink bag and you're gonna prime the tube. Then you're gonna squeeze that bag, the drink bag, and then kind of in about 15 seconds, fill the entire foam with the contents of the bag. The interior piece of that foam is highly wetting, so it wants to suck up that water. And, but then there are pieces on the outside that are hydrophobic, so it doesn't want the water to penetrate through. So how can we you know, mix that up? What are the issues? What does that look like? Because ultimately this piece of technology, even though it's so simple as a piece of foam, it can potentially do so many things. If you watch the videos, you see it, you're gonna think it's dull and what are these goofs doing? <laughs> you know, you're gonna say that. But basically what it is, is it's a dyed liquid. It's actually red fruit punch that we use, which is a simulant for urine. Do you like the backlight view? Yeah, we're geeking out over that. It gives us the complete view of this whole thing. It's nice. That's yeah, pretty cool. So the purpose of this experiment is to see how well does the foam hold the liquid in microgravity and if we completely agitate it and really put this piece of equipment through the wringer, how well does it bounce back? Honestly, the most surprising thing that's come out of it is how simple we can make this technology. Maybe the foam project is going to enable a backup system for the toilets or maybe it's going to be a new wastewater processing system altogether and that's just the future. It's just, I mean, it, it feels like anything is really possible. We are very hopeful that our work, which started out in fundamental research and is turned more and more applied, could actually get to the point where it's delivering on equipment. Equipment that functions without moving parts or a minimum of moving parts, without power without noise. We'd love it to have a system that just works passively by its shape. And whether it's on the moon or in orbit around the moon or in way to Mars, we'd love to contribute in that way and in the way that makes others able to do that too. So by publishing the design laws, by the design experience, by the experiment experience, we'd love to do that too. I think it's just cool. It's so simple and it's so cool. That experiment is a good example of the kinds of science research that the facilities on the International Space Station are designed to support. Supporting science is one of the overarching goals of the space station. Another one of those big goals is encouraging the growth of a commercial space industry. And in the last few years, the station program has been making good progress on that front too. Take a look. The International Space Station has proven to be a one-of-a-kind laboratory. 
Microgravity conditions allow for experiments impossible to duplicate on Earth. New science, new knowledge. The station has also proven to have the capacity to serve as an incubator for new business, accelerating the development of a new space economy in low Earth orbit. The business of doing business on the International Space Station has become a primary focus of NASA in the last 10 years. Mike Reed is the manager of Space Station Business and Economic Development for NASA at Johnson Space Center. He explains how businesses are enabling research. Supporting all of the research activities on station is becoming a significant activity in and of itself. Companies like Bioserve, TechShot, Space Tango and others operate over 20 commercial research facilities housed on the station. Scores of companies provide services as payload developers, helping researchers translate their experiments into hardware small and light enough to be transported to and housed on the station. All of these commercial activities support business models and expand the numbers of entities with experience in conducting business in space. As NASA increases the opportunities for companies to perform research on the space station, it's likely that the number and types of companies taking advantage of those opportunities will also increase. That in turn will help keep the partnership between NASA and business thriving. Reed notes, soon we hope to see private astronauts as part of NASA's LEO commercial development program. Some of those may be researcher astronauts. That is, researchers who work directly for a company and are trained to come work in the station during private astronaut missions. To enable the beginning of development for a next generation, commercially built and operated low Earth orbit research platform, the space station is hosting new commercial modules. The NanoRacks Bishop Airlock became operational in February 2021 and Axiom Space plans to launch a module to expand the habitable volume for research and other activities on the station. NASA's commercial resupply and commercial crew programs are also enabling multiple companies to develop and operate the next generation of spacecraft and launch systems. This commercial transportation to and from the station has fueled the growing market share of U.S. launch providers in the world marketplace and is providing expanded utility, additional research time, and broader opportunities for discovery for NASA's mission of space exploration. The innovative use of public-private partnerships employed to support station research is becoming the template for NASA's new exploration initiatives. The Artemis program has the goal of landing the first woman and first person of color on the surface of the moon. In addition, Artemis plans include establishing a lunar outpost built by private companies and eventually harvesting resources from the moon. Doing business in space has become one of the fastest growing businesses on Earth. The space economy has expanded by over 60% in the last decade and is now valued at roughly $400 billion. That commercial success is matched in importance by the knowledge gained from private research conducted on the space station. It's knowledge that spans hundreds of disciplines and will help millions here on Earth, as well as those traveling beyond the reaches of our planet for years to come. For more information about how private companies can conduct their research on the space station, go to www.nasa.gov iss-science. To discover more about the space on, around, and beyond our planet, visit science.nasa.gov. The major goals of the International Space Station program are to support the commercial use of space, to advance scientific research and promote international cooperation, and help lay the foundation for future exploration out beyond low Earth orbit. Those future missions will be part of the Artemis program, which is working towards the first flight of the Orion spacecraft on the Space Launch System rocket and supported by the ground systems at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Here's an update on the progress that's been made in getting the hardware ready for that next flight.
Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Aki Hoshide, and Tama Pesquet flew the Crew Dragon Endeavour to the International Space Station. Now, before their launch, we brought them all into the studio to test what they know about each other, or what they think they know about each other, as they looked forward to spending six months together in space. Megan, uh, intelligent, witty. She's smart, knowledgeable, and she's brave. Shane is thoughtful, but also a prankster. Calm and smooth. Aki, always smiling. Competent, funny, and, and a good friend. Tama, extremely skilled and fun. Tama is gregarious. Playing golf. Mm, baking. Ugh. I'd say French. <laughs> Japanese. I know Soichi answered it that way too. Me. I have OCDs, so it's, uh, the, it's in my ballpark. Well, I have good experience with Tama. He and I are very tidy, both of us. Uh, it's still, you know, the jury's still out on Aki and Megan. I'm relying on Shane's army experience to keep us uh, in shape up there. <laughs> Me. Me. Me, definitely. Me. <laughs> because I always make them laugh for some reason. Uh, just enjoying life together in microgravity, it's such a special environment and getting the chance to do that with Megan, Tama and Aki is going to be very special. And of course landing with them is going to be really exciting. Karaoke night. So just hanging out on the space station, working together, living together, um, spending some uh, precious time with each other. Aki. Um, maybe me? Well, I don't know, but pretty much all of them. I would say Megan has a great poker face. The rest of us were pretty bad. <laughs> Probably not me. I think Shane would win in a foot race. Toma. That's a tough one. Shane runs every day, but I think Toma would be highly motivated to win, so it would be very close. But we will have to figure that out. We'll have to try. I don't know that. <laughs> You'll have to ask them. <laughs> it turns out I'm an interrupter. I come from a talking people, so I have the tendency to interrupt. I speak. But I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I, did I interrupt you there? Let me just... Being the hands in hands-on science research in space is just one part of the job of an International Space Station crew member. The astronauts and cosmonauts also share the experience of being in space with us Earthlings, and they also talk to students about key scientific concepts, as astronaut Mark Van de Heij demonstrates in this demonstration video. Welcome to the International Space Station. I'm NASA astronaut Mark Van de Heij. Today, we're going to talk about Newton's third law. How do you think it will hold up in microgravity? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that in every interaction between two objects, there are a pair of opposite forces acting on each object at the same time, a force pair. You can see that there are many examples on Earth. In space, thrusters expel one way and the vehicle is steered in the opposite way. Hello again, more basketball stunts that I can't do on the ground, at least not while getting this much hang time. <laughs> All right, back to serious business. We've got a basketball right here. It's gonna be one, object one on the second object. If object two, myself, applies a uh, force to object one, then that same force will be applied, according to Newton's third law, by object one onto object two. However, there's a big disparity in the mass. Object one is a very light mass object. Object two, myself, is, is a larger mass object. So, I'm gonna try to make myself about the same shape as this ball. See how that works for us. And I'm gonna apply that force. You 
saw that force applied to the ball made it accelerate quite a bit. It really didn't accelerate me much at all. Newton's third law again, but this time we're gonna use two similarly massed objects. Joe and I have about the same mass. So Joe, get into a ball, I'll do the same. I'm gonna face you this way so that I don't throw you into something you can't see. Right. Now I'm gonna get into a ball behind Joe and I'm gonna apply a force to him. Notice that the, when I applied a force to Joe, it, pushed, it accelerated Joe away from me, but I got accelerated away from him as well because the force applied to Joe ended up being the same force that was applied to me. Now you've seen Newton's third law in space. Now test it out on Earth. See you next time. The opportunity to spend six or so months on the International Space Station, as men and women from around the world have been doing without interruption for more than 20 years now, has led to the development of new technologies for space exploration, groundbreaking scientific discoveries, and an experience of cooperation among nations while fostering the commercialization of space and space flight. But even more than that, it's caused many of those astronauts to experience a shift in their world view. NASA's Karen Nyberg is one of them. first flight was two weeks and a lot had to get done. I distinctly remember the point when I stopped and thought, I did it, I'm here. My goal was to be an astronaut and now I'm in space. I remember seeing the beauty of Earth, but I don't remember any more profound thoughts about it at that point. I think it was when I got into my long duration flight and spent a little more time that I really just started to take it in a little bit more. The entire experience is actually very surreal. First, you're launched on a rocket. You're pulling G's as you're, you're going out of the atmosphere. You're looking at the Earth for the first time. You're floating. You're, everything is different, and it just is all just such a different experience that it almost doesn't seem real. In fact, when I did my space shuttle flight for two weeks in 2008, when I got back, you could have convinced me I never went probably, if there weren't pictures. This experience is so unusual and so different than anything you've ever done in your life that it's hard to grasp at all. And I was very excited then when I got assigned to a long duration because I thought it's going to burn in my memory and all that, and it was the same thing. I came back and my memories were there, but it, it almost didn't seem real. Looking at the Earth for the first time, you just notice the vibrancy of it. It's so bright, pictures don't do it justice. It's equivalent to me of backpacking out the mountains where you're trekking along and then you come to a clearing and you're overlooking some valley and the sun is setting and it is, you know, you're like, how could this get any prettier? And you take a picture and then you go back and look at the pictures later and you never have that feeling again. It, it never brings about the feeling that it did. And same with watching a beautiful sunset or a sunrise. I have not seen a picture that gives me the same feeling that I felt when I looked with my own eyes. It started to make me understand that everything is connected. What is happening in the ocean over here can affect what is happening on land over here. It's just all one being and it's all interconnected. And so I think we tend to live in our bubble of our world that's here and it's hard to think about other people on the other side of the world and be empathetic toward them really because you don't know them and you don't know their situations and I found seeing the earth really changing that perspective for me and then listening to a news story in the morning and flying over that particular part of the world in the afternoon 
it really affected me. And then just realizing, I mean, that's, it's home. Often we think home, and you know, right now home is Houston, Texas, and childhood home is Minnesota, but home is Earth. If you want another look at any of the stories you saw today, you can find them on YouTube and Facebook, along with lots of other great features on a wide variety of NASA topics. Be sure to look around. If you're looking for good conversation about human spaceflight, check out Houston We Have a Podcast. It's our weekly show talking to folks involved in all areas of space exploration. Today you'll hear from Gary and five different guests as the whole podcast team gets together to reminisce about favorite episodes during a celebration of the fourth anniversary of this weekly extravaganza. Go to nasa.gov slash podcast for this week's episode. All the previous episodes are there too, so is the full library of all the NASA podcasts, and it's all on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud.